Well, good morning. You guys can grab a seat. We let the worship team know you appreciate them once again leading us in worship. It's a fantastic morning of worship. So I don't know how it went with your flower or plant this week. You see this one's a little, a little stressed, a little challenged. How many of you made an effort to give to your plant this week? I'm curious. Quite a few of you. Fantastic. Well, as you see, this one has not done so well this week. Actually, uh, we were quite intentional in not giving to this plant. And we, uh, as far as I can remember, this one hasn't been watered since a, a week ago yesterday. And as you see, uh, he's, he's about done. And um, as a matter of fact, not only was he not watered, but we chose specifically not to give this little dude any sunshine, and he just kind of sat by himself, and that pretty much speaks for itself. I have one that looks much better, and we're, we're quite proud of this one. Got a little bloom. I think just, just today, how many of you have seen actually a bloom on your plant? We were out of town yesterday just for, for one day, and we got back, and we had a little bloom on ours. I think our bloom is red. Is our bloom red? It's blooming, so... This one uh, is doing much better. But I love the thought as we've here in the office and uh, at home this week been looking at our plant and thinking about what it means to be givers. I hope that you have spent some time this week doing the same. And I hope in just a real simple elementary way you have allowed uh, this plant and your attention to this plant to remind you that in order to grow, we got to give. And the simplicity of a plant and the nurturing of such and the idea of giving to see growth. We're going to let God's Word, His Scriptures, really lead us in the direction He would have us go today. By the way, good morning. My name is Jeffrey Smith. Good morning. I'm one of the pastors here. I count it a joy to be with you and, as always, a joy to open God's Word with you. Uh, will you take a stand with me this morning? We're going to begin in a word of prayer. I know you just got seated, but I want us to stand. And specifically, we, we knelt last week as we uh, lifted this time up to the Lord. And I just want us just to stand in unity and to stand in just in confidence of who God is and His hand upon our church and His hand upon who we are as people individually, who we are as Donaldson first and more importantly, who we are as Christ followers and truly want to spend a moment just giving this time to Him. A lot to unpack in Scripture this, moment, this morning. Will you, will you bow your heads with me? Uh, and as you bow your head, we, we've been saying a prayer corporately together. And I'm going to encourage you even now to say this prayer and just to repeat with, after me this morning. I'm going to listen. And I'm going to pray. God, help me follow you today. I tell you, I've even added a prayer to this this week that I've just prayed in, in my time and as I've thought through this time this morning, I want to encourage you just in your own words to, to pray this morning that, that God would open your hearts and that he, that he would truly show you his desire. That's what I've been praying this week. Father, show me your desire and the giver that you would have me be. Will you just make that your prayer this morning? And God, you would just show me your desire, the giver that you would have me be. Lord, as we look at two potted plants this morning, and the obvious is before us, and when we give, we see growth. Lord, we believe that you are calling us to surrender all, we know that is a life pursuit, and that as we give more and more of ourselves away, Lord, that you fill us up and that you do what you desire. And Father, we're asking that today, and that as people, as a church, for those here in this room and those joining us online or the, the archive later at some point, Father, that for every one of us today, we would be in a a spirit of submissiveness, a, a posture of complete willingness for you to do as you desire, that we would listen, that it would be our prayer. God, do what you desire and that we would follow. Lord, as we open your word, Lord, we ask that you speak to us in powerful ways, that you, Lord, just place uh, your hand upon our hand 
and that you take us where you desire we go. For your glory, we give you this time. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You can grab a seat. God's Pew Research states that America, you probably know this, is in a, a time of specific religious change. That as you statistically look at the ebb and flow of, of culture and cultures embrace or lack thereof a religion, Christianity. We, we spoke a few weeks ago about we are a very religious culture, but not necessarily an evangelistic culture. We're in this, this season of, of religious change. And the nuns category, this is the category of people who answer no to the question of embracing a religion, what religion do you embrace? The nuns category, as you, see, as you see here, has been growing, while those identifying as Christ followers is decreasing. Uh, in the Courier, a South Carolina Baptist paper uh, just reported at the end of 2020, as many as 20% of churches, isn't this interesting? Staggering. It's difficult to hear and read this. As many as 20% of churches could close. Within the next 18 months, again, that was spoken in 2020, and we are halfway through, or at least six months into those next 18 months. Barnard reported this in 2020, that one in three practicing Christians has stopped attending church, whether in person or online. Lifeway, just last month, spoke these words. Actually, uh, a friend of ours uh, was standing here on this stage and just really delivered some powerful information to us as it relates to the Lifeway Research Ministry there. And, and he said this, it is estimated that five to 10,000 churches are now closing every year in America. Think about that. Five to 10,000 churches are now closing each year in our nation alone thought about this statistic this week, and I thought about the idea of Donaldson first and the, the legacy and the history of this church. And again, I, I don't take the privilege lightly to stand here and open the Word with you each week and just the many who have been here before, and whether it be here at, from a pulpit or a stage or in classrooms or in the parking lot or members and guests, just the, the, the rich history, particularly here in this building since 19. 12 of all that the Lord has done and all the people that he has used. And as I think about this statistic, we just considered that five to 10,000 churches closing their doors each year, it brought me to the obvious question, what if we were one of such churches? What if Donaldson first closed its doors? Have you ever thought about this? We pray, we believe confidently that that time will not come, that the Lord has his hand upon this church. But uh, imagine for a moment, what if, just take that journey momentarily for me and with me, what if Donaldson first were such one of these churches and we closed our doors? I think the follow-up question for us would be, would the community notice? Would there be a void in the community? Would the community feel that hit? Would the poor, would those in need be negatively impacted? Would the community even notice if we were gone? This brought me to this idea, and I'm going to remind you of this often today and throughout this week through our socials. I hope you're following our socials at Donaldson First and in our ministry celebration tonight. We hope you'll be here tonight and next week. A lot to unpack as it relates to just the business of ministry here on campus. But I'm going to remind you often that if we are to be an impactful and a thriving, an impactful, a thriving, an engaging church here at 25 26 Lebanon Road, we must be a church of givers. Do you agree with this church? We must be a church of givers. Of course, absolutely, we, we consider the financial choice in, in, in that statement. And we're going we're gonna to do so next week. I hope you're making plans to be here next Sunday. We're just going to talk finances and God's responsibility to what obedient giving looks like and what it looks like in our lives as individuals and families and, and as a church. But this mantra, listen to this, guys, this mantra takes us far beyond a financial choice. I know you know this. But let's let Scripture remind us of this today. It takes us far beyond the choice of how do I use my money and how often do I tithe and what is 
my tithe. That, that is a part of it, absolutely. But we're going to talk more specifically today about the idea of giving as it relates to my life and my heart. And let me just ask you this as we get going. Do you truly believe, church, consider this. Do you truly believe that when you give, there's, there's potential for change in another person's life? I believe the answer is absolutely yes. That when, when I choose to give, there's tremendous potential for change. That when I give, there's potential for, for growth. We see the obvious here that when I choose not to give, just in this one little example of the impact that me not giving had upon this plant, and then the impact that me choosing to give had upon this plant. It's obvious, and Scripture is going to show us this today, that when it comes to giving, that often change follows. And more times than not, change is to the benefit of the recipient. I believe this to be true, and I believe that when it comes to giving, whether it's my time, whether it's coming my money, whether it be of a, a talent, a, a, a gift, whatever it may be, that there are tremendous opportunities that lie ahead for growth. And that's why I'm so excited over, over the next two weeks. And that's why I also paused. I've never really thought about this before, but when it comes, let me just take you here for a moment, and then we're going to open up the Word. We're going to be in Matthew for the most part of our time together today. If you have your Bible with you, there's a Bible in front of you. You can also follow along at the Donaldson First app. But when I think about giving and the idea that, yes, Jeffrey, it makes sense to me that, that when I give, change follows, and that when I give, we can often see the fruits, and growth is the fruit of that choice to give. It brought me to this, this question of if I do, in fact, know that good things flow when I choose to give, then why don't I choose to give more? You ever thought about this? If we know good things come from our giving, then why don't we give more? Whether it be of our resources or our talents or our time, if we believe growth comes from giving, then why don't we choose to give more? Well, if you're writing, you should write this down this morning because I believe this to be true. Though I know this to be true, giving isn't always easy to do. Would you agree with this? It's not always easy to give. It's not always easy to give. Why? It's simple, because we're selfish. I'm selfish. I know I'm selfish. I got a lot of work to do in areas of my life of things that are important to me. Not necessarily bad things, though there are things less than good I know in my life, and the Lord continues to bring these before me. I'm fallen. I'm sinful. And so there's a lot of areas of my life where I need to give more and surrender more and get better at doing so. But just in the areas of life that aren't necessarily defined as wrong, I know there are areas of my life that I hold on to, that I like things the way I like them. How many of you like stuff the way you like stuff? I should see every hand go up in here. You like life the way you like life. You want to do life the way you want to do life. And I'm the one in the room willing to admit, and I hope you'll join me. It's not always easy to give because I just don't want to. It's not always easy to give because I like things the way I like them. I like things the way I want them to be. And guys, I think it's really important that we begin here, that we begin in admitting this, that it's not easy to be a giver, and Satan wants us to buy the lie that we don't need to give. He wants us to buy the lie that our way is okay. And Scripture's going to remind us today, if you will allow it to do so, it's going to speak truth whether you receive it or not. But I hope you'll receive it. Everybody say amen. Scripture's going to remind us today that it's not, listen, it's not all about us. It's not about us. You know this. Man, we got a world whispering Heck, not even whispering. we got a world screaming a lie into our ears, telling us, it is all about me. We're going to let Scripture show us how we can get better at giving today. And as a matter of fact, that's today's family focus. If you're just joining us today, we're so glad you're with us. Each week, we strive to give you a focus where you can unpack with your family. And today's family focus just simply is, how can I be a better giver? Every one of us should write that one down. All the family focuses are in the app, by the way, if you forget them. When they're loaded now with a little bit more than 30. I love going back and look at our family focuses. But let's let Scripture specifically drive us to the right answer today. Matthew, if you have your Bible with you, there's a Bible in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. There is a gift from Donaldson First uh, right in front of you somewhere on that pew. We'd love for you to take that Bible home with you. But how can I be... A better giver. Really so many places that we could go in Scripture today to allow God's Word to lead us. I want to take you to a story entitled in my Bible as the rich and the kingdom 
of God. Matthew 19, Jesus is speaking. He has just spoken to, to little children and, and loved on them, and now he turns his attention to a wealthy man. Read along with me in verse 16. Matthew chapter 19 God's word reads this, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus responds, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbors as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Hmm. When the young man heard this, look what happened. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. What an analogy. Can you imagine such a beast of an animal of the day going through, as it says here, the eye of a needle, a very small entrance. There is much debate as to whether Jesus was, was speaking there of just a, a consideration of actually a, a camel and a needle or of an entrance place located there in the city. Either way, we see the impossibility before us. Jesus, as always, gets right to it, and he speaks. Look at it again. I tell you, it is hard for someone, verse 23, who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. My goodness, there is so much there. I'm going to try to give you as as much in a short amount of time as I can this morning. I have greatly been impacted by this story in the last couple of weeks of spending time just walking through what God would have for us today, guys. And obvious, the, the obvious before us is this story of this man who was called to make an ultimate sacrifice by our Savior. A very wealthy man, Jesus called him not only to give away his finances, but ultimately to give away his life. You see that? He says, go sell everything you have, give to the poor, and he doesn't leave it there. He says, then, come follow me at the end of verse 21. Here is a rich man by all accounts who's lived a morally good life. He's had a lot of checks in all the right boxes as to those things that he has done Correctly, and he asked Jesus a very important question. Did you catch the question? Look again at the beginning of this passage, verse 26. The man comes to Jesus and he asks, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? The question above all questions. If you're writing this morning, you should write that. This is the question above all questions for humanity. How do I get eternal life? How do I skip out on hell? The place that I deserve because of my sin, the brutal reality of the story that life at one point for all of us or another will come to an end on planet earth and we will spend life after life in one of two places, either in heaven or in hell. There's a lot to that. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But here is this man facing Jesus, asking an important question, and Jesus says to him, why do you ask me about this? There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Well, we see the man's response that he he has kept them. Jesus walks through these with him. Look at verse verse 18. Do not murder, commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and your mother, mother, love your neighbors as yourself. The Ten Commandments, Jesus is walking through these, knowing the response of this man that is to follow. And sure enough, the man follows accordingly. In verse 20, he says, I've done all of these things. All these things I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Probably wasn't expecting the next one. Again, look at verse 21. If you want to be perfect, isn't that an interesting word there? If you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. 
and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come, follow me. Hey, guys, will you write down the word poor this morning? I want us to talk about this for a few moments. Just, just write down the poor. I believe in a room this size, or even if it were just a handful of us, and we each were to define the word poor, we probably all would get to the same place, but we might get there a little differently in the usage of our words. So think about poor for a moment. If you were to define poor, someone who is poor, I wonder how you would get to the definition. Most likely it would be based upon your circumstances or the circumstances of, of those around you. I think if, again, we were all to stand and define poor, we'd probably get to the same place. The words we used, again, might be used a little differently. For, for, for instance, if you were watching the news this week, you know that billionaire Richard Branson, who owns Virgin Records and the new Virgin Hotel that just went up down the end of uh, Music Row there uh, in Nashville downtown. What a beautiful hotel that is, the owner of that and of uh, the Virgin Airlines. He's now also a what? He's an astronaut, sure enough. Spent a whole lot of bank, I'm sure, and he went to space on the Virgin Galactic flight. Studies, well, not necessarily studies, but Google just tells you this, that Mr. Branson's net worth hovers somewhere around $6 billion. $6 billion. Wouldn't that be fun? $6 billion. Let me say that again. If Mr. Branson were standing here today and he were to look at my checking account and compare it with his checking account, I don't know that he would say this, but in his mind he might be thinking Jeffrey Dean Smith's a little poor. I don't know that he would say that, but in his definition of wealthy and poor, we're at two extremes. And sure enough, if, if I were to take a walk not far from here to the left or right of our uh, property, most likely I would probably find someone who is without a home, someone who probably before has knocked on our door asking for help. We have help a lot of people throughout the week, and we're blessed to do so. You're such a giving church. But in comparison to Mr. Branson's wealth and, and mine, and then mine in comparison to, to one who is, is homeless, some might call such a homeless person poor. And that's a great conversation for, for us to have about our responses to specifically those defined as, as, as poor, those without home or without finances or without clothing. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that over the next couple of weeks. But I, I want to I take you past, listen to this, I want to take you past the idea or rather the definition of the word poor as it relates to haves and have-nots. And I want you to write this this morning because here's where I believe the Scripture is leading me to lead you. And that is this, that when we think about poor, we think so in terms of these two words, someone's needs. Will you write that this morning? Looking past a financial need and a have or a have not, but really a, a deeper internal need of someone. Absolutely, there are those in our community who are in need of food and who are in need of, of clothing, and there's much as a church that, that, that we can do, because there are people here equally in this room who have much to eat and have a whole bank of clothing and live in really nice homes, you know this, but yet deal with extremely challenging needs that need fulfilling. And I want us to think about this today. I want us to think about the idea of what it looks like to reach out to those who are poor because they are in need. As a matter of fact, when you write this this morning, there are people everywhere. There are people everywhere who are poor because there are people everywhere who are in need. Do you agree with this? There are people everywhere who are poor because there are people everywhere who are in need. I want us to talk about what our response as a church can be to this. And I want to begin that conversation by first looking internally at our own hearts, by putting the mirror before ourselves. So let me give you a couple of things to consider as we think about what it means to be a giver, reaching those in need. The first is this. I'm going to give you four this morning. Give my thing. If you're writing, you should write this this morning. Give my thing. It's comfortable being rich. I'm sure it's comfortable being rich. We all probably live very comfortable lives, and those with a lot of money probably would say that even though there's great drama that could potentially come with the management of such wealth, there's comfort that comes with this. I have a feeling that this man lived quite the comfortable 
life, having at least all he thought he needed or desired. But the thing, that's the important word in this moment we're here, guys. The thing, we underline the word thing this morning. The thing for this man was his unwillingness to give of his wealth. The thing really wasn't his wealth. It was his unwillingness to give away his wealth because his wealth was the thing, or rather it was the choice not to give of his wealth, that was the thing keeping him from being who Jesus was calling him to be. It leads me to this obvious question. If you're writing, you should write this question this morning. What's my thing? Because say, well, Jeffrey, I don't have a thing. All is good. Well, then will you be prayerful in this moment right here, in this moment right now, for anyone to your left or to your right, who has such a struggle? Well, Jeffrey, how do I understand my thing? Well, I've thought about this week, and I've allowed the Lord just to lead me in the things in my life that need addressing. And I made a list in my office on Thursday of about four or five things. I'm not necessarily going to share those things with you right now, but I'll tell you, God shared them with me. And I opened the door to that conversation with him. And I was amazed at some things the Lord laid on my heart that I had not thought of in a while that need addressing in my life. And I want to encourage you to do the same. Whether it be here or at some point this week, or maybe in your D group time or small group or home, home group that you're with, or with a spouse, or in your own personal time with the Lord, I think we all have things at some point in our lives, things that we're unwilling to let go of, or maybe things that we're not even sure the unwillingness is there, but when we allow God to get us to the next step in that walk with him of really helping us dig deep, we see and we allow his spirit to reveal things in our life that need addressing. This man coming to have a conversation with Jesus probably really had no idea that the thing in his life was the thing Jesus is calling him to, complete surrender. He's lived a good life, a morally good life. He can check the boxes in the things in his life that he says and believes, and we see here by Old Testament that he's done well, but we see there was more to the story. Hey, could it be, listen church, could it very well be that there's more to your story, more that God is calling you to, more things in your life that he's asking you to let go of, to give away, to be the giver in all areas and not just the comfortable areas? Did you hear that? To be the giver in all areas and not just the comfortable areas? That's not always easy to do. I think we all have these places in our lives, and if we're willing to admit, oftentimes they're accompanied with an unwillingness to let go. I know for me, giving of my thing, getting to the give, begins with admitting. Listen, getting to the give begins with admitting, I need to give away my thing. Because here's who I want to be. I wrote this, actually I just wrote this yesterday afternoon, it just really spoke to me as I thought this weekend about this passage and our time together. It's a long sentence and it's for me and I hope it's for you. If you don't write it, it's on the app. Shoot me an email and I'll get it to you if you're not taking notes this morning. But listen guys, I want to give away anything that helps me better honor God. I want to give away anything that helps me better honor God, love the poor, and point people to eternal life. But I could say personally, this is a true mission of mine. And the Lord has shown me this this week, that Jeffrey, there are some areas of your life where you got to get better at giving. So that I can better honor Him, so that I can be more strategic about loving the poor, so that I can appoint people to eternal life. I'll be honest, as a pastor, it has been really enjoyable to be here and open the Word with you guys. And I really enjoy allowing God's Word to speak to me and His Spirit to speak through me to you. What a privilege to be that catalyst. But I tell you, once I hop off of this platform and step into just the normal real world, I I struggle with some of these things. I'm a lot better here pointing people to eternal life than I am out there. And the Lord's really convicted me of this this week. That there are people that serve me meals at my favorite restaurants probably. There are people that live probably just a few doors down from me. There are people that come on our campus to do work for us. And I've I've never shared Jesus with these people. I've tried to live good before them. But I've, I've struggled with this idea of honoring God and loving the poor and pointing people to eternal life when I'm away from this building. And I want to get better at this. Do you want to get better at this? And I want to be better at this. I don't want to just be a giver here because I'm employed as a pastor of Donaldson First. 
I want to be a giver because that's the call Christ has placed on my life, to give above all and to not be concerned about the things as, as much as being concerned about what things is God calling me to let go of. Not about how am I going to miss them or am I going to miss them or what's the fallout by surrendering those things. I don't want my mind to go there because that's where Satan wants my mind to go. What I desire to do is to be less about focusing on the impact of losing the thing in my life and more on my desire to surrender whatever God's calling me to in my life. That's who God wants us to be. That's who he's calling us to be. And that's what's really spoken to me in this passage. And guys, I got to tell you, I just want to brag on you for a moment. You are such a giving church. You are such a giving church. I love being a part of a church that understands the importance of being the hands and feet to Jesus. We've partnered with the Moss family and the impact they're having in the Sneedville area. And we're so thankful for the Mosses and all they do and the privilege they give us to join them as a church. I'm so thankful for Room in the Inn. We took a break this year with DCA being on our campus and with COVID being here. But we're going to be back at it next year. And that impact of, of people who are homeless coming on our campus one night a week to get a shower and to get some food and to get some goodness in their hearts. And I'm so privileged to be a part of a church that's missional in that regard. And our, our food pantry and who we're becoming there and how that ministry is growing and how it's about to grow and our partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank. You are a giving church. And let me, let me also say this. I know since I've arrived that there have been some changes made on campus, some of which haven't always been comfortable. They haven't been comfortable for me, even though I'm new here. But I tell you, you guys have been so gracious. You have been a giving church. We've called you as a ministry team to a lot. I mean, aesthetically, there's a lot of changes that have happened right here in this room. This room looks completely different than it did a year ago. And there may not be Voices in the room necessarily 100% that like everything about this room and what it is and what it's going to continue to become. And I get that and I understand that, but I got to tell you, you sure have been gracious about it because you understand God is calling us to be a giving church potentially unlike we've ever been before. And there's surrender and sacrifice that comes with this. And I just have to say, thank you for this. But I want, to, I want to give you this and we'll go on to the next point. Let me remind you, another long sentence. We are only as strong corporately. Listen to this. We are only as strong corporately as we are committed individually to honoring God with every area of our lives. We are only as strong corporately as we are committed individually to honoring Him with our things, with every area of life. Our lives. He is calling me to give away my things. Secondly, a really important one, give my very best. Everybody say very best. Give my very best. This rich man was a giver. We see this. He was a giver. But God was calling, do you see the word that the Lord used here? He says, if you want to be, look at verse 21. If you want to be what? If you want to be perfect. If you want to give your very best. If you want to be about your very best, then, hey, it's a whole nother conversation we need to have. That's what the Lord is calling him here to, to be about giving his very best. Sadly, we see the man, he just couldn't do it. He, he just couldn't do it. This request from Jesus was just something that he just wasn't quite willing to do. And guys, listen, I, I get this. I don't want to land here and stay here, but I get it. Because would you agree? Sometimes it's just so much easier to live in the muck. It's so much easier to live in the mundane. It's so much easier to be casual. It's so much easier to embrace the mantra, well, good enough is good enough. We talk a lot about here, around here about this is the Lord's house. Do you believe and agree that this is the Lord's house? This is the Lord's house. This is is the Lord's house. Let me say it again. This is the Lord's house. And that's why we as a ministry team continue to inspire and encourage and, and nudge you lovingly that we should give this house our very best. And we're going to talk about that. I hope you're going to be here tonight for our ministry celebration. We're going to talk about what we've done and where we're headed this week and next Sunday night. So much to unpack. It's going to take us two weeks, and I'm super jazzed about it. I hope you'll make plans. We're going to be here at 6 p.m., 6 to midnight tonight. No, I'm kidding, not 6 to midnight, but we're going to be here at 6 p.m. tonight. We're going to hit a lot, and then we're going to just hit pause. We're going to pray and go home, and then we'll pick it up next week. We've been meeting with personnel, and we've met with stewardship. We've met with church council. We've had just so many different 
different conversations and I'm excited all that we're going to bring over the next two weeks. And really all of it has to do with this reality. This is the Lord's house. This is the Lord's house. Go to Genesis chapter 2 real quickly. The Lord called us from moment one to bring our very best to him. And we see that with the responsibility that he gave Adam. And we also see that, and I'm going to get it here real quickly, in Numbers 3, if you want to go ahead and just kind of bookmark that one as well, with the priest and the Levites and their responsibilities in the tabernacle. And it's interesting, we see three critical words that help define for us God's desire for us to bring him our very best. It takes us, again, all the way back to Genesis 2. Look at Genesis 2, one verse I want to show you. Adam has been placed in the garden. He's been given responsibility to give it his very best. And look at what it says. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Look at what it says. To work. Everybody say work. And to take care. Everybody say take care. Of it. Let me read it again. The Lord took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work and to take care of it. It. Guys, God sets, whether you realize it or not, God sets the bar very high right here. We know this because of the definition, the Hebrew definition of the word work and the words take care. Go to Numbers real quickly and I'll show you what I'm talking about. We see these words again, or I can just read it to you. This is Numbers. We'll put it on the screen. This is chapter 3. Look at Numbers, or listen to Numbers chapter 3. When we see here the description of those working in the tabernacle, the priests, the Levites, we see these words again. Verse 7 says, They are to perform duties for him and for the whole community at the tent of meeting. Listen, here it is. By doing the work of the tabernacle. Then here are the words take care. Look at verse 8. They are to take care of of all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, fulfilling the obligations of the Israelites by doing the work of the tabernacle. We see, guys, listen, God is super serious about us bringing our very best in just these two terms, the the term or the word work and the term take care. Write this down if you're writing. The word work here in the Hebrew, it actually means to serve. And the words take care actually mean to guard. These aren't playground words here. These are big time, super serious, give it your very best words, a challenge from God. We see it here, and then Jesus, interestingly, repeats these words thousands of years later in his challenge to this man. He's calling him to be the giver that he wants him to be. He's calling him to work, to serve, and he's calling him to take care, to guard. We see that that Jesus calling this man to perfection, calling this man to surrender all, is really calling him to give his very best. It's a pattern we see throughout the entirety of Scripture. Actually, this word work in Scripture appears, listen to this, more than 87 times. This definition meaning to work, to serve, and to take care, to guard. God's given my very best in work. Listen, given my very best in work means that I'm doing so as if I am serving God. That when we bring what we bring, whether it be in teaching a class or in offering grace to a child or in offering forgiveness to a spouse or in how we talk with someone on campus or off campus about things we like or don't like, bringing and giving our very best really is about an attitude of serving. And that when we communicate, it's as if we're working, we're, we're, we're serving, we're taking care, we're guarding God's house, his very best. In our homes, we're guarding our homes, we're serving our family. We spent 10 weeks talking about serving in our Family Strong series a few weeks ago. And it was really a, a message in a series about dying to me to elevate thee. Not for your own glory, but for the glory of God. Amen. That when we choose to work, when we choose to serve, when we choose to take care and guard, we are, we are serving and we are guarding God's house, God's people, and most importantly, the truth of God's word. Amen? So we give it our very best. That's who we're becoming as a church. You guys have been so good at this, we're going to get better at this. Because it's who he is calling us to be. God expects, write this down, God expects and God deserves my very best. 
Hands down, God expects and God deserves my very best. I got an email this week from someone who I think was being very gracious and someone who I think was really trying to give me a compliment. And one of the statements in the email was just simply this, Jeffrey, I, I, I see you enjoy change because we've had a lot of it. And he was being encouraging. I think he really was being encouraging. But I thought about that for a long time and I just kind of wanted to just kind of to throw this out here. The guys, our ministry team, we're not about change for change. We're not about change for our will. And we're not about getting change and asking for change so we can get what we want. I can truly say you have a ministry team every Monday and often throughout the week who, who, who begin our week and continue the flow of saying, Lord, show me how can I serve and how can I guard? A ministry team who wants to give their very best. And so when we see an area that we believe needs changing, we unpack it, we talk about it, we talk to you about it. We're going to do that a lot tonight. And then we go before the Lord and ask God, will you lead us? Because we don't want to change just to change. We don't want to get into that. What we do want to do is be about giving you our very best. Because you deserve and you desire my very best. Look at the screen real quickly. In marriage, we just ask yourself, am I giving my very best? Just, just ask yourself. At work, am I, am I giving my very best? Just think about that. Because it's easy sometimes at work. Good enough is good enough. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to know how much I work today. As long as I look busy, it's all good. Am I giving my very best at work? Am I giving my very best to my children? Am I giving my very best to what I do when not just everyone is looking, but when no one is looking? Man, that's a really important one. When no one is looking, am I giving my best to God? God is calling us. He is calling us to give our best. Here's another one. Number three, give my service. I'll quickly give you two more and we'll wrap this morning. Give my service. Last week, uh, the Fishers, their best friends were in town. I'm hurt a little when I hear them say they're best friends. I'm just going to be honest and throw that out there. But their best friend, no, they're, they're best friends, lifelong friends uh, from, e well, not lifelong, but for many along from East Tennessee uh, where the Fishers used to serve. They joined us, Jason and Jennifer Fields. They were here. And I had a really enjoyable time getting to know Jason. We went to lunch Monday last week. They were in town. One of their boys was playing baseball. And we sat down. And I, I noticed just after shortly sitting down that Jason had a, a pretty jacked up left arm. And so I just asked him about it. And he just shared a very uh, compassionate, very convicting two-minute message on the service that he's given our country and the cost that his body took there in Afghanistan. And I'm mesmerized, mes mesmerized as I'm listening to Jason talk about his Humvee. I think it was his Humvee that, that got hit. And he talked about the loss of, of those who, did, who didn't make it back. And he talked about the, the, the battle, the hit that his body took. And later on in the conversation, I said, hey, man, if, if you could go back knowing that what happened before might happen again and might mean that you couldn't come back. Because like some of your friends who didn't make it back, if you knew there was a possibility, would you still go? And he said, absolutely, hands down. And then he said this. He said, Jeffrey, I love to serve. He said, I love to serve. And I so appreciate him and all those who have surrendered so much so that we could have freedom. And freedom, I think, sometimes we take for granted. But I walked away from that lunch thinking, man, that's who I want to be. Jason loves serving his country. And I want to be about serving, truly evangelistic minded, focus driven serving. Is that what you want? Because church, listen, if you listen, if you really want this, then does change really matter? I mean, if you're really about serving, does it really matter which classroom your Sunday school class meets in? If you're really about serving, does it matter if our worship starts at 10.30 or 11.15? If we're really, really about serving, does it matter how many instruments are or on aren't the stage? I mean, does, does it really matter if we're really about serving what people wear when they're on a stage or what people look like who greet people in the parking lot? I mean, if we're really about serving... Does anything other than let's make decisions that reach our nation and our state and our city and 
their families for Jesus. Isn't that really the only thing that matters? Really? Man, that's who I want to be. Like Jason desiring to serve his country because he loves it. I want to serve the Lord because I love it. And whatever he asks, that's who I want to be. That's the giver I want to be. Whatever he calls me to, no matter how uncomfortable or how much I don't like it, that's the giver I want to be. That's who I want to be. That's how I want to serve. That's what I love about the Tuckers. Tuckers, can y'all come up here real quickly? Will you guys put your hands together and just thank the Tuckers, Angie and Wayne, for for being here this morning. So last year, Angie and Wayne uh, stopped in my office, said they'd like to talk for a moment. We had, uh, as far as I can remember, had only met briefly here in in the worship center. And they said, we'd love to come and and, and talk with you. Good morning, y'all. And... We, we sat in the office, and you guys come join me up here. Um, and so when the music starts, remember, just sway like this. <laughs> no. Can solo? You can't. You sure can't do solo. And so they said, Jeffrey, we, we feel called to, to Donaldson first. And they were here at, at Donaldson first at, at one time, and the Lord led them elsewhere. And then the Lord has led them back here. I just wanted you guys to take a moment. I know many of our, our, our people know you, but some might not. And I loved your story and just the, the heart that you shared with me there in your office of why you believe the Lord has called you back here to Donaldson first. Okay, first of all, just let me say, I feel really inadequate after the story you just shared. Mm. Um, we were here before, um, for a, we think maybe around 20 years, a good while, and we had the opportunity to grow spiritually here under some very good teachers and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me okay. just catch my breath. It's okay. it's all right. <laughs> um, and had the opportunity to serve. And then we felt God leading us somewhere else. Nobody was mad. Nobody was upset. Nobody's feelings were hurt. We just felt God leading us somewhere else. And we didn't move right away. Um, we've stayed here and worked through that for about 18 months before we finally remembered something that Pastor Roy used to say, delayed obedience is disobedience. And when you're facing the fact that you're being disobedient to God by not doing what he's telling you to do, you kind of move. <laughs> so um, we, we set out, we found where we believed he was leading us to serve, and we went there, um, another church in the area, and we did what we felt like he led us to do. Um, then last fall we felt that stirring again that he was leading us to serve somewhere else and we moved quicker this time so uh, we didn't delay um didn't really think about it being first baptist but we heard some great things were going on here and when we learned more about it and the impact that you're wanting to make in the community and the difference that you want to make in people's lives in this area. We wanted to be part of that, and we felt like that's where God wanted us to be. And so we're back, you're and back. we're very thank- thankful we're so to be glad back. You're back. He we're brought so us full circle, back. and we feel like we're back home. And so when we spoke in my office uh, last fall, you specifically talked about serving. Mm-hmm. And I know we have many here who are serving. We're doing a, a Let's Go Volunteer Leaders training. Uh, for servers and future servers in a couple of weeks. We hope you'll all be there. If you're serving, you need to be there. If you're thinking about serving, we'd love for you to be there. We want everyone to be praying about that. But um, Wayne, I know specifically you shared with me, you guys have a heart for serving. Why, why do you believe that is? And why are you so passionate about serving? Well, one thing, God calls us to serve. You know, like you talked about today, he calls us to serve. If we don't do it, somebody else will. And so one thing I think uh, I'm passionate about serving is the impact impact we can make on people's lives spiritually and in their lives in the community and make them a positive impact to help them live a better life for Christ or whatever and um, have a vision let them see that through Christ we can is there's a difference yeah. just make an impact in people's lives the main thing I think I'm passionate about on serving people. and that's why thank you thank you Wayne that's why we we say it often that everyone has a place here we, we, we call you to that. We encourage you to this. We went all in by years in, everyone finding their place to serve. You guys are launching a home group. Is that right? right. We've been talking about, we have life groups to meet on campus. We have home groups. 
uh, four now, I believe, that are meeting off campus. And if you feel led to, to lead a home group, we'd sure help to get you started with that. Tell us a little bit about the home group. I know you guys haven't started yet, but you're looking to start this fall. We're looking to start August 1st, and it's our house. We live in Big D here. And uh, uh, so we will be meeting the first and third uh, Sunday nights at 6 p.m. And uh, we, 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 we have some refreshments, and we will get into the Word a little bit. And it's a big chance for people to grow closer to each other and the relationships develop. And, you know, outside these four walls here, yeah. that's where it begins. And, and so we can g get closer to each other. So anything else you want to add? I always thought that there should have been an 11th commandment, no offense, um, <laughs> that you, you should eat together. And then I found the script, or, you know, it's like one of those things, the scripture just kind of jumped out at me after reading it, and I'm telling how many times I saw the scripture in Acts 2, 46, that says they went from house to house, eating together and having fellowship, and I thought, see, there it is. There so it is. that's what we <laughs> want to do. We want to, we want to have fellowship, and we want everybody to be fed physically and help feed each other spiritually as well. Amen. Wayne, would you be willing just to, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but we have many leaders out here, sure. life group, home group. I also believe we have life group and home group leaders to be out here. Would you, before you guys step down from the stage, just be willing just to pray over our leaders and future leaders. Heavenly Father, just thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come back here to serve you, Lord. Lord, just be with each leader, uh, small group leader, life group leader, and then the, the groups themselves, Lord, just guide them to direct them. Just be with them, give them the spirit of grow, to reach out, to serve as community, and serve us, serve others. Hmm. Lord, just be with the life groups as they go forward. Be with them, any potential lead, life group leader or small group, a home group leader, that give them the urge and convict them to start the group. The more we uh, have, the more we can grow, Lord. Lord, the sacred opportunity you've given us. Forgive us many sins. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Well, you guys let the Tuckers know you appreciate them. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Uh, I just, I love y'all's hearts. Thank you so much. And this idea of service really begins just with that first step of, Lord, what is your will? And what do you desire of me? And what are you calling me to? And I think it's also important for us to know, guys, as, as we finish here uh, in just a moment, just to be mindful of this, that we, guys, we know this, that when we, listen, when we invest in the lives of others, it, it can get messy and it can be challenging. We all know this because we're all fallen. And it is a absolute surrender to say, I'm willing to step out and be used. And as we see here in Scripture, in this call that Jesus has placed upon this man's life, to, as he says here, to be perfect, it's about that ultimate follow. It is about that ultimate. Listen to the words of Jesus again. If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. That's a promise from Jesus. And then he says, come, follow me. Guys, it leads to that last give I want to give you this morning, the ultimate give, give my life. To give my life. Because nothing else matters, amen? So many good things that we could do and accomplish in life. As we see here in this rich man in Matthew 19, so many accomplishments but yet he went away sad because he knew that he wasn't willing to make the step to give his life. What a brutal, brutal statement for us to end on, but I think it's an important reminder to us, guys, that there will be many. There will be many in hell who were givers of much, but who never gave what mattered most. Let me just ask you this morning, if you would, just to bow your head. And with your heads bowed, with your eyes closed, would you ask this question? The question is this, what do I need to give? Just ask that question this morning. What do I need to give?